I, uh, I want to apologize for two things. The first thing is that I've gotten to the bottom of my shampoo bottle, so it's a little heavy on the hair, which is why it looks so abysmal at this time of day. The other thing that I'm going to apologize for in the beginning is uh, you are the first to see this particular presentation. I do these presentations all the time. This is brand new, okay? So these are brand new ideas that uh, I'm going to try out on you and see what you guys think. I call this particular uh, presentation the slow motion music revolution. A lot of things are happening right now, sort of off the radar, kind of behind the scenes that you may not be picking up on from the mainstream media. So I'm going to give you a bit of a, a background look at some of the stuff that is actually happening with music in Canada, in North America, and around the world. So here are five things, five things to watch out for. And I'll go into these in more depth in just a second, but something I call the mobileization of music. There's a whole concept of access to music versus the possession of music. We're seeing something called the rise of the curators. We're seeing the decline of sound or the decline of high fidelity. And then the whole concept of independent free agents versus indentured servants when it comes to music. So let me just go on here with the whole concept of the mobilization of music. In the 1950s, and we talked a, bit this, a little bit about this earlier, uh, we had the transistor radio in 1954, something called the Regent TR1. This was the first mainstream portable radio. And I can't tell you how big a deal this was because up until that time, the radio was something that was stuck in the middle of the living room. If you wanted to enjoy the radio, if you wanted to enjoy music, the only place you could enjoy it was in the living room with mom and dad after Amos and Andy and before Texaco Theater with Milton Berle. That's all you could do. But then this thing comes along in 1954 and suddenly music has been liberated from the house. And you could take the transistor radio wherever you wanted to and your music came with you. Such a huge, huge concept, especially when you realize that in the 1950s, it was the rise of the teenager and the rise of the teenager's music, which was rock and roll. And these things went hand in hand. So you could take this devil music that your parents wouldn't let you listen to in the living room out with your friends and enjoy it with them and other, you know, rebellious, horrible, awful youth. We're seeing the same sort of thing happening, and Alan alluded to it earlier, is the idea of music becoming more and more mobile. It's becoming more and more mobile thanks to smartphones. More people are getting iPhones, Blackberries, Palm Prees, uh, the Nokia N and the Nokia E series, um, Android powered phones that we're seeing from Google. And what you're seeing on that little graph there, I got a new program so I learned how to make graphs over the weekend. Um, what you're seeing is that the number of mobile downloads is increasing with the number of smartphones that we're seeing in the marketplace. And there's going to be a bigger and bigger push to getting people to download music, not necessarily to their computers or to their iPhones or iPods, but to their mobile devices. Right now, we're sitting with um, oh, this 4.6 billion cellular subscriptions in the world. And right now, we're seeing it's, it does, okay, in Europe, and, sorry, in uh, Japan and Korea, 80 to 90 percent of music downloads are going to phones. In Europe, it's anywhere from 26 percent in the UK to somewhere around 15 percent on the continent. Here in North America, they say it's 10 percent, but it's more like five. So what we need to do is get more smartphones into the marketplace, and you will have more and more people trying to convince you to download the music directly to your phones. So there's the whole idea, there's something to watch there. This shift, an increasing emphasis on making access to music more and more mobile through the smartphone and similar devices. And again, one of the reasons you want to do it is because it's so simple. Oh, I hear that song, click, I just bought it. That's what you're going to see people pushing you towards. Next thing we have here is access versus possession. This is a little hard to get your head around if you're of a certain age. Because if you're old, the way you got music, the way you enjoyed music, was you had to possess it. You saved up the money from your paper route. You went down to the store. Maybe you had to take the bus. Maybe you had to make mom drive you. Maybe you had to go and park yourself. You went into the store. You hoped that your record was there. If it was, you took it to the counter and handed over your hard-earned money. 
You then possessed this piece of plastic, you took it home, put it on a device, be it a turntable or a CD player or a cassette machine, whatever it was, and you enjoyed the music. That was the route that you had to go. That is no longer a value proposition. You want what you want, when you want it, wherever you happen to be on whatever device you have. And you don't want to worry about having to go through all the hoops required to possess something. You just want it. So we're seeing what's being, um, we're seeing this transition from the need to possess music, to physically own a piece of music, to being able to access whatever song you want, wherever you happen to be, at whatever time of the day, no matter what kind of device you happen to have in your hand or in front of you. The problem here in Canada is that we don't really, we're way behind on this. Um, for example, has anybody heard of Spotify? Spotify, oh, Spotify is absolutely brilliant. Let me explain what it is. It's a UK thing. It was invented by a couple of Swedes. And you subscribe to Spotify for 10 pounds a month. And for 10 pounds a month, you can have as much as 3,000 songs on your hard drive or on your phone. Or if it's on your phone, you can move the 3,000 songs to your hard drive. And if that's not good, you buy a new phone, you can move it from there to that device. So these, device, these, these songs are completely portable. And you choose from a library of six or seven or eight million songs. And what's brilliant is that while well, the songs stay there, and you can you know, switch in these songs in and out, and the songs stay there until you stop paying for them. You stop paying your 10 pounds a month. It's like a utility, it's like electricity, it's like water, it's like gas. But the moment you start paying for the, them again, they appear. So if you can get whatever song you want, whenever you want it, wherever you happen to be, on whatever device you happen to have, why do you physically need to possess it? You won't. If it's, all the music is going to live in a cloud someplace, or in the case of Spotify, it's going to live in this little puddle that you make on your hard drive or on your device. It's, it's pretty cool. And you're going to see in the next little while the battle for streams. He who controls the streams will control the world of music. Spotify is just one thing. Unfortunately, again, we can't get it in Canada. Um, and we are also limited by what we can do with streams, on-demand streams in Canada, by um, music publishers, by um, the copyright board, and by the record labels. I'll get into that a little bit later on, but it's something that really, really, really makes me mad. Next, we have the rise of the curators. It used to be that the only people that you got your music information from were your friends, the guy at the record store, the guy on the radio, or maybe the VJ on TV, or maybe in a magazine. Those were the people who provided you with the music that they thought you needed to listen to. And you bought the music that they told you to buy because they were there to tell you what was cool. They listened to all the bad stuff so you didn't have to. So you trusted that DJ, you trusted that VJ, you trusted that writer or the dude at the record store. Then the internet comes along and opens up the world of music to an infinite degree. Suddenly there are millions upon millions upon millions of songs out there which allowed you to choose any song you wanted which allowed you to discover any song you wanted, which allowed you to listen to any song you wanted. And that was awesome! Until you realized that there were millions and millions of songs out there and you didn't know where to start. You didn't know where to go. You may have found a song that you really, really, really liked. But at the back of your mind, you're thinking, God, is there a song that's even better than this one out there? Has somebody found a song that's even more magical than this? Oh, I gotta stop and go look for more songs. So what we're seeing, if you look at the yellow line, it's the amount of time that we've been spending actually enjoying and, in, and really getting into music versus the other lines, which are how much more time we spend searching for it and researching it, how much more uh, we get confused about what's out there and what we need to be listening to, and then the cries for help. You know, where do I start? What do I do? Point me in the right direction. So what we're beginning to see is the rise of curators. Cool hunters, tastemakers, trusted filters, people and things that will give you at least a place to start. 
which is one of the things that we're doing right now at Chorus. We have our own little research and development thing that we call Explore Music, which is human-powered music recommendation. It's sort of a social network thing. It's sort of a trusted filter thing. But the idea is to help you start exploring music in a certain direction. You don't have to like whatever, whatever you know, we put in front of you, but at least you'll know more than you did five minutes earlier. There are other mechanized ways that you can do it. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard of Pandora. Pandora, great service that we can't get in Canada because of copyright and, and territorial rights. Um, the Last FM, great, oh, we can't get that either really properly, can we? Um, but this, we, sp well, we can't get Spotify either. Yeah. So there's Explore Music, which is me helping you, you know, anyway. You're going to see a rise of curation. Cool hunters, taste makers, trusted filters, people who will show you how to get through this tyranny of choice that uh, we've, been we've been presented with thanks to the internet. Here's something that's rather interesting that I've been watching over the last five or six years, and it's the decline in the appreciation of high quality sound. Now, if you're of a certain age, you probably spent some time at one point in your life going to a stereo store looking for the biggest pair of speakers and the most powerful amplifier you could buy. And the whole idea was perfect sound or as close to perfect sound as you could possibly get. This was the idea behind the compact disc. Perfect sound forever. No hiss, no crackles, no pops. It was great, wonderful, super high fidelity music. Then the internet comes along, and its favorite medium for music, the MP3. Quick little science lesson here. MP3s, is, um, what they are, are compression algorithms that take a real world sound and squish it down to approximately 10% of its original volume. If it's smaller, it's easily transportable, and it doesn't hold up a lot of, take up a lot of space in a hard disk. Now that's great, but, the way that you make an MP3 small is you take away stuff, you take away data from the original file. The brain can't hear the stuff you take away because it's masked. It's a whole thing called psychoacoustics, something that they've been working on since the 1930s. It's, it's a long, crazy scientific thing. But MP3s, just know this, MP3s are made small because stuff is taken out of the original of the original sound, the original song. The problem with MP3s is that the brain, not your ear, but the brain can tell you that something's missing from an MP3 file. When you hear a song, you know how you listen to a song and you really like it and the hair stands up on the back of your neck and you get chills and you want to dance and all that sort of stuff? Okay, that is a chemical reaction to the secretion of a hormone called dopamine. And there are three places in your brain, uh, the cerebellum, the uh, amygdala, and the hippocampus. These are areas of the brain that actually sec secrete dopamine. So when you have an orgasm, it secretes dopamine, the body goes, yeah, give me more. If you take a hit of cocaine, the body secretes dopamine, and the body goes, yeah, give me more. When you hear a great song and the hair stands up in the back of your neck and the body goes in response to the dopamine, yeah, give me more. So there really is a sex, drugs, and rock and roll portion of the brain. That's what I'm saying. It's very true. So but what happens with an MP3 file, if you listen to it, the brain spends precious milliseconds trying to fill in this, that, that information that has been removed in the compression and the algorithmic compression process. And in that those precious milliseconds that the brain spends looking for this stuff that's not there, you lose an opportunity to secrete this, a sufficient amount of dopamine. So MP3s quite probably don't make you feel the music as much as an analog version of the music would. Something to think about. The other thing, too, is that instead of listening to music on a big stereo, we're now listening to music on earbuds. So compressed music through $19 earbuds. 
Some people have the big headphones, but the point is that they're still listening to music at 128, 160, 192, or maybe, you know, maybe 320 kilobytes a second. Still squished music. There was a very interesting study done by a university in California. The professor would test music on freshmen each year. And for the last seven years, what he would do is he'd play a piece of music that was an MP3, and then he would play an analog or a WAV file, like an uncompressed file. And he would ask these people, and there's the same song in both cases, and we'd ask these people, which one sounds better? And increasingly, as time went on, the people who were listening to, who picked, pick, well, what they did was they picked the MP3 file, and they said, that sounds better. Even to, but to an older generation who grew up with vinyl records and big stereos and uncompressed wave files, we go, how, can't you hear the distortion? Can't you hear how it's all squished? Where's the dynamic range in all this? But because this digital generation grew up listening to compressed music on earbuds, their perception of beauty has changed. That sounds better than the uncompressed file. So the longer we are living in the digital and the MP3 world, the less appreciation the general public seems to have for old school high fidelity sound. It'd be rather interesting to see where that all goes. Next, uh, we're going to talk about artists, the last little paradigm shift here. Indentured servants versus independent free, it should be independent free agents. In the old days, what would happen is that you would sign a record contract with a major label. That basically meant you were doing a deal with a bank. You would get an advance to make a record, to go on tour, to buy a new van, to buy some new equipment. You would tour, 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 record, record, record until the advance ran out. Then you would go back to the record company and say, hey, did I make any money from that record? And they go, no, I mean, we gave you an advance. You're paying us back the advance. Uh, we'll give you another one if you make another record. So you would make another record, and you would go out on tour, and you would try and sell as many records as you possibly could. And then you go back to the label and say, hey, how do we do? And they went, well, you barely recouped your advance. We'll give you another one if you do it all over again. And that was the cycle. And what you would do is you would hope you would have a big enough hit at some point in this cycle so that you had a measure of financial independence. So a lot of bands made a lot of records, spent a lot of hours on the road, and made absolutely nothing for it. So what we're seeing, but then what happened was the, the CD market collapsed at about 2002, and the record labels had to deal with the new realities of downloading. They had to jettison a whole bunch of acts that weren't recouping their advances album after album. So what we ended up with is a hierarchical sort of um, spreading of, of, of what an artist is. On one hand, we have something called the 360 deal. Now, the 360 deal is when you sign a contract to a major record label or a large entity like, say, Live Nation, and you get a bunch of money up front. For example, we have Madonna up here. Madonna signed with Live Nation. She got an advance of $120 million. Live Nation, under the terms of this 360 deal, has 10 years to make back that $120 million. During that time, they own Madonna. She has creative control over her music, but they book the tours, they take all the t-shirt revenues, they take all the DVD revenues, they take all the things that uh, they can get their hands on to recoup that $120 million over 10 years. On the other end of things, you have the super free agents, and Pearl Jam is a current example of that. They no longer have an exclusive deal with any record contract. Their manager will go to a variety, of uh, a variety of labels and say, hey, my band, my superstar band, who has sold 50 million records, uh, has a new album. Would you like to put it out? And the label would say, yeah. Where do we, you know, sign with us. And we go, no, no, no. You sign with us. And we tell you what we need you to do. We'll give you a piece of the action, but we will take all the risks, but we retain all the creative control but all we need you to do is go out there and make sure the records get into the store. So those are the two opposites, the 360 deal 
and the free agent deal. On the free agent side, you have Pearl Jam, Nine Inch Nails, uh, Oasis was there before they broke up, Our Lady Peace is on that end. On the um, 360 deal side, you have bands, you have Madonna, Jay-Z is, uh, Jay-Z signed a deal. You have younger bands, a lot of younger bands are getting into 360 deals like Paramore. Um, anybody who signs, for example, with the Arts and Crafts label here in Toronto, that's a 360 deal because they take care of all aspects of the band's career. In the middle, however, you have this weird sort of entrepreneurial group. These are bands who are doing a little bit of music and a little bit of business and they are doing whatever they need to do in order to maintain creative control yet find some kind of security when it comes to their role or their place in the music industry food chain. A couple things here. Here's Canada, I think, is being left behind in a number of areas. We're on the sidelines as new technology and consumer devices are being rolled out. You know, we were late to the iPhone. How the hell can Canada not get the Kindle? I mean, you can get a Kindle in, in the Congo. You can get a Kindle in places that the IOC hasn't heard of yet. But you cannot get a Kindle in Canada when it becomes available. We can't get Pandora. We um, can't get Spotify and other subscription services that are on the horizon. It's really frustrating. Entrepreneurship and innovation in music delivery is not being encouraged in this country. Part of the reason is we have high charges for data and wireless use. I got my Rogers bill. Here's what happened. I was in London, I was in the UK, and I had to get to the BBC. I needed a map. So, and I had to get there in a hurry. So I turned on my international roaming button. I go, okay, here's my map. Okay, Great Portland Street, turn left here. Okay, good, turn it off. That's how long it took. I got my bill today, 820 kilobytes of a download for $26.40. So with high data use, how are we gonna be able to use these personal devices for our subscription streams, for our downloads, for our social interaction when it comes to music. It just absolutely drives me crazy. The other problem that we have, too, is with radio stations. I'll try to make this really simple. If you have an over-the-air traditional radio station, you pay a blanket license to a series of organizations that take money and distribute it to the artists whose music you use as part of your business model. That only makes sense. If I'm going to be playing your song to make money, for my company and my shareholders, then I should compensate you for using your material in my business model. I have no problem with that. So radio stations play, pay a series of fees, there are four of them, on gross revenues. It's a percentage of gross revenues. And for that, we can play whatever songs we want, as many times as we want, and in whatever form we want, as long as we pay that amount of money. And it, can imagine, it amounts to you know, a million dollars, a million five, two million dollars a year pre-tax, pre-expenses, but that's fine. That's the cost of doing business. The reason we can't do, oh, the other thing that we can do as a result, uh, under the terms of that license, is that we can simulcast that over-the-air broadcast with an internet stream. So as long as what you're pumping out over the air is the same as, and at the same time as, what you're streaming out through your website, that's cool. That's covered, no problem. The moment, however, you want to have on-demand music programming from your website, on-demand music programming from your website, the rules and regulations in this country state that you have to track how many people are listening to each individual song for however long these individuals are listening. So it takes a single person. You have to have somebody on staff who tracks each stream, the number of listeners, living at, uh, listeners listening at any given second to any given song. Then there's a complicated formula where you determine how much of a fraction of a cent you have to allocate to each one of these listeners listening to each one of these songs. Does your head hurt? Because mine does. And this is the reason radio stations, traditional radio stations in Canada, do not offer on-demand music streaming in this country. We're syndicating some radio programs to some American radio stations. They don't have this problem. 
So if I want to stream a show I create in my house with music that I assemble from wherever, I can't play it through a site that originates in Canada. However, I can give it to a say a clear channel radio station in Dallas and they can play it in which, I, in which case I just embed it in my web page and I play it from there. This is the kind of regulatory bullshit that we have to deal with in this country and it's really really frustrating. The copyright board, record labels, music publishers, it's, it's again we're not valuing um, entrepreneurship and innovation at the highest levels. All the other stuff, we're letting it go, and then that's great. You know, guys like Alan over there and his Indie Love Radio, that's brilliant stuff. But the people who could actually make a big dent in it uh, on, um, right now, we can't do it because we're hamstrung. Anyway, here's what you need to know. Music is going to flow more and more and more like water. It is going to be a utility. You are going to use it as, you're going to pay for it as you use it, as much or as little as you like. You'll be able to get whatever song you want, wherever you happen to be, at whatever time of day, on whatever device you happen to choose. It'll be platform agnostic. The music is going to live out in the cloud someplace. You don't know necessarily where, and you don't really care as long as you can get it whenever you want it, wherever you happen to be, at whatever time of the day, on whatever device you happen to have with you. This is a massive shift. The record companies are not really happy about it because they've built their business on selling you pieces of plastic. If they no longer have to sell you pieces of plastic, what have they got? The wireless companies want this to happen because they can charge you more for data. The handset companies want you to do this because they'll be able to sell you more handsets. Again, really cool, but until Canadians get through this regulatory crap that we're dealing with right now, we're going to fall further and further behind the rest of the country, the rest of the world. When you can go into Japan, or in Singapore, or in Korea, or in any number of countries, and be able to do that whatever you want, whenever you want, or wherever you happen to be on whatever device you have, and you do it once, you will never, ever, ever think of music the same way. It happened to me um, I was actually in the Caribbean, and I, I love to run. And there's a hill, very steep hill in this island that we go to. And I got to the bottom of the hill with my brand new iPod, and I'm thinking, I'm going to run up this hill. And I'm going to start by, by uh, listening to the same song I listen to every year, at the bottom of this hill to help me go all the way to the top. I look at my iPod and I go, oh my god, I forgot to load it. I have spent a year dreaming about this moment to run up this hill. It's one of the most inspiring things I do all year and the damn song is not on my iPod. How could I for... Oh. There's, there's some kind of open wire Wi-Fi network here. Okay. iTunes. There's my song. 99 cents, download, okay, on we go. That was such a powerful consumer experience for me, I will never ever be the same because I got what song I wanted wherever I happened to be at 7.30 on a Sunday morning on a device that I just happened to have. Watch for it, it's going to happen. And it's going to happen in such slow motion over the next couple of years, you're not even going to notice it. It's just going to sort of happen. And then when you look back to today or whenever it happens to be, you're going to go, how did we ever survive going to record stores? How primitive. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it.